Sorry, I'm just trying to add everyone at once to the room. Okay. okay. So we'll start at once, just um, two more, one more minute and then we'll start. Okay. And please, if you're not, um, please, can you mute your microphones so it doesn't disturb the video? I don't know how to mute everyone. I think I did that, but I'm still hearing some people. Um, more people are coming in, so I'm trying to add them up. Please, if you're not, um, please mute your microphones. I don't know why I put the setting on muting all mics, but I don't know how some people were able to unmute their mic. So people came in on mute, muted. So please, if you unmuted your mic, can you mute it again? Okay, some people are still joining. So let me just wait till we are 100 and the class is full and then we'll stop, then others can watch on YouTube. So, okay, just a minute please, more people are joining. So more people are coming in. So as soon as the class is, the room is full, I'll just close the room. Then um, you can watch on YouTube. It's being streamed live on YouTube. OK. 
Okay, I think everyone is in. Keep some people ask your comments. That nice small speaker. I did charge them for that uh, this thing. You bring and come for me. No. Um. So with me today we have Doctor Bukumi. Um, she's my very good friend. Um, she has also written most of the licensing exams I've written. So she'll be helping me today. If you have any questions, we'll both be able to help you. I can see Dr. Ijoma has joined the room. He's also someone that attended the OSCE skills class. So many people that are in this room, you might not have seen my face before. So when we start the class, I'll introduce myself so you can get to know me better. Some people may have attended the OSCE skills class <laughs> or you're following me on, on Instagram or Twitter, you may have heard my story already. But if you haven't, there'll still be a video so you can get to know me as well. I'm just taking some time so that we won't go back over the class for people that are joining us, right? So as soon as the room is full, we'll close the, um, we'll start immediately. Just. I just don't want to start then keep adding people to the room when we're already in session. Is that there, if there's anybody that has anything to say at this point, please feel free to say something. This is the time to unmute your mic and say something if you have something to share. Good afternoon. Good evening. Is it evening or wherever you are in the world? Okay, hello, Dr. Joshua. Nice to meet you. Yeah, I just watched your YouTube and I must say congratulations to you. You've done so well. In fact, there are very few persons that have done what you've done. So I'm happy to be in this class and I hope to get the best out of it. Thank you very, very, very much. Thank you so, so much. So I'm really glad with that, <laughs> that you have got that. So um, my YouTube channel is going to be more active from now on. I'll be talking about my experiences with all the exams one by one, breaking down how I went through all of them. So, uh, and I'm also into skincare. So if you watched my skincare video, I said my channel is going to be about health, education and skincare because those are the things I'm passionate about. But for those that are really interested in the exams, you can follow me on health. We'll get into all of that. So let me just wait till the class is full and we'll get started. Okay, um, this is 10 minutes gone now and I think we can start. Oh, please, I, it's very difficult to reach us. I can see some people are typing in. Um, uh, Iriba me wants to know if it will be available after the class. I, I should hope so, right? <laughs> And will it be saved on my YouTube? I should hope so. Oh, yes, please. All right. Ayodele said we can start now. Very good. Yes, we're definitely starting now. Thank you very much. So, um, let me, let's start with without further ado, right? So I'm going to share my screen. So this, welcome everyone to the ECG basics class by Dr. Health Then More. And I am Dr. Health Then More. There are some people in this class that have not heard about me before. So I'm going to play this video for the benefit of those that haven't heard about me. Please enjoy. Cerebral Mentorship Community. For the past five years, I have put a lot of effort and poured my heart into building health and more. 
but its primary goal being to connect, promote, and keep medics and individuals at large informed at no cost. During the same time while working on health and more, I have written and passed the English and medical licensing exams in the UK, USA, and Canada. This means that I have written and passed the IELTS, the PLAB 1, PLAB 2, MSRE, MCCE, QE1, QE2, Nakoski, in the US, the USMLE Step 1, Step 2 CK, Step 2 CS, and Step 3. I've also taken medical communication classes to boost my communication skills. Today, I am pleased to say that I am ECFMG certified and I hold the licentiate of the Medical Council of Canada. I am also on the medical register in three countries, the UK, Canada, and Nigeria. Most importantly, I have been accepted into a residency program. I was able to do all of this while married with two toddlers with the right kind of support from my family. However, in a quest to achieve all of this, I was faced with so many hurdles. I came so close so many times to quitting and throwing in the towel. Therefore, knowing how rigorous the journey can be, and in a bid to help any other person that would like to take the medical exams in the UK, USA, or Canada, I and a team of doctors who have also written and passed the exams have come up with a new initiative. It's called the Doctor Health and More Tutorials. You can learn more about these tutorials at www.drhealthandmore.com. And henceforth, using at Doctor Health and More, I will be more upfront and personal about my career journey, and I will also be sharing my opinions on health and other social issues. So, if you have any questions regarding your health, your career, I will be most happy to answer them. If you have any question regarding any of these medical licensing exams, you can always ask me. If I don't have the answer, at the very least, I can help find someone that can answer your questions. And meanwhile, if you're interested in career advice from different health professionals, you need to check out Progeny Cerebrum. Visit Progeny Cerebrum on Instagram or the website at www.progenycerebrum.com. My name is Dr. Helden Moore, and there is more to come, so stay tuned. Till then, bloom like a rose with butterflies. I just heard I'm Dr. Demo. My real name is Dr. Rebecca Karukulu, and I am a team of doctors that have written and passed the licensing exams in the UK, USA, and Canada came together to form the Dr. Health Demo tutorials. We offer tutorial services to doctors interested in writing the MCCQ, the PLAB, the USMLE, and IELTS exams. My information is on the screen right now. My phone number, you can reach me on phone and on WhatsApp. And um, That's my, um, those are my details, right? And um, besides um, tutorials for exams, we also offer, I personally offer the consultation, that's the career navigation consultation, which help with what to study or how to prepare, which pathway you should take if you're interested in writing any licensing exam. I offer that service as well in the career consultation. So, that's my WhatsApp number, 201-689-4489. Um, Becky, you have to increase your volume. We can't hear you. Thank you. Okay. My WhatsApp number is 201-669-4489. And you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, or Facebook at Health Then More. Those are my handles, right? So, um, that's that. So, that being said, let's start with the ECG lesson for today. The commonest ECG we all know is the 12th lead ECG. Um, can everybody hear me very well now? Yes, good. Yes, 
You can hear you very well. All right. So this, the commonest ECG is the 12 lead ECG. Now, for the fact that you're in this class, it means you think ECGs are kind of difficult, right? But ECGs are not difficult. I, from studying ECGs, I found out that the secret to understanding ECGs is knowing where the leads are, what the leads are there for. And when you know what the leads are there for, it will let you know what problem is happening when that lead is telling you something. It's like if I put a man at, I put four security guards, one at my main gate, one at my door, one inside my room. If the security man at the main gate starts to scream, I know there is a problem at the main gate, right? If the one in the sitting room starts to scream, I know there's a problem in my sitting room. If the one in my bedroom starts to scream, I will know there is a problem in my room. So that is how the leads are. If you know where the lead, what the lead does, what it is looking at, you understand that this is where the problem is. So it's not you. If you don't know that, you don't. You cannot proceed into interpreting an ECG. Another thing is the waves. You need to understand what the waves mean. If just the way I said, when you know what the lead is looking at, you know where the problem is. Same thing with the waves. If you know what P wave means, if there's a problem with P wave, you know that oh, P wave. This P wave, the problem is from the atrium. If there's a problem in QRS, and you know QRS is ventricle, is the security man in your city room, you know, okay, the problem is from the living room. Am I making sense? Yes, you are. Yes, yes. Very good. yes now, let's start from the beginning. What, how does the ECG start? How does it, what, what goes on with the ECG? When you look at the ECG machine, there are 10 wires on that machine, right? So those are the, the, the wires we put on the chest, right? After we put our stickers, we connect those wires to the legs. Those 10 wires are six for the um, chest legs and four for the limbs, right? The chest legs are V1 to V6. Um, I'll need to mute everybody, please, just a minute. So um, the purpose of allowing uh, participants to unmute is in case I need feedback, feedback, right? It's not for you to, if, you don't, if you're not talking at that moment, please don't unmute yourself. It's only when you want to contribute to the class, you should unmute yourself, please. Um, so as I was saying, the six chest legs, right? So out of those 10, we put six on the chest and say V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6. Then our limbs, limbs mean, um limbs mean our right we put one lead is it that we are putting one on the wrist that limb lead when we put it on the wrist it's called avr that's if i put it on my right wrist is avr or we can put it on the shoulder here that's avr that's my this is my right hand right then if we put it on the left wrist is avl if we put it on the left shoulder it's still avl but i'm just saying there are two, when we, the, the, the um, limb legs can either be put on the wrist or on the shoulder, right? Am I making sense so far? Yes, you are. Then yes. for the, um, for the, for the feet, if we, we put both on the left ankle and right ankle, we put, if we put it on the left, um, ankle that will be called avf augmental augmented vector f foot right if you put it on the right ankle it's called avr hmm? so those are the um limb legs and those legs are the one on the right is neutral that's why i wrote it here that one of these is neutral so the only active legs are v1 to v6 avr AVL and AVF. Now you see some people, sometimes the, the lead on the foot, it might not be put on that ankle, right? It might be put just at the lower part of the abdomen below the rib cage. We now call that AVF. I'm going to show all the pictures of this. So don't imagine too much. I'll still show you the pictures, but let's just have that idea. Now, um, 
That being said, where do we put the LEDs? We've talked about where we put AVR, where we put AVL, where we put the AVF. What about the chest LEDs? V1 to V6. We put V1. Imagine, you know, all of us know this is the sternum right in the middle. V1 is at the fourth intercostal space, close to the sternum, right? Fourth intercostal space. V2 is opposite it. Fourth intercostal space, left, on the left side, close to the sternum. Now, V4 is directly on the apex bit. It's on the fifth intercostal space, mid-clavicular line, while V3 is in the middle between them. Maybe I should just be showing the picture so you won't imagine too much. So these are the, this is what we're, we're talking about, right? This is V1, is on the fourth intercostal space. So this is the manubrum. Under the manubrum is the second intercostal space, second, third, fourth, right? So this is where we put V1, is on the right side. We put V2 directly opposite it on the left side. Then V4 is at see the mid clavicular line, right? It's in the middle. We put V4 on the apex of the heart. Then we put V3 in the middle between V2 and V4. While V5 is still on that fifth intercostal space. Can you see the line? But it's on the anterior axillary line, while V6 is at the mid axillary line. Now, this, this is very important for us to note what this picture means. By looking at this picture alone, just imagine something. Can you see V1 and V2? They are standing by a line, right, which is our sternum. Those are our septal legs. That means anytime there's a problem in V1 or V2, something is wrong with the septum of my heart because that is the lead I'm counting on to show me what's going on with my septum. If something is going on, in V3 and V4, there's a problem with the anterior surface of my heart. Because can you see these legs are in front? Am I making sense? Then if something is happening in V5 and V6, they are lateral. So any problem in V5 and V6, they are looking at the side of my heart, the lateral part. That means there is a problem, lateral problem with the heart. Now that being said, We'll move to the next picture. Look at what I was saying. This is AVR. This is not the only place you put AVR. AVR can also be here. AVL can also be here. Then see AVF. The fourth leg, which is the one on our um, right foot, is a neutral leg. It's just the way we have our adapter in our room. The, the one on top is neutral. You know, we have a neutral one. So that's what N, the, the leg on our right foot does. It's neutral, it doesn't really do much. So now, I'll show you something in the next picture. In this one now, AVR is here, AVL is here, and AVF is here, as we said. Um, that's our, the next picture is more explanatory. The next picture is more explanatory. Now, look at AVR. You will not say, but you've only told me about nine legs so far. You've told me V1 to V6, that's six legs. You've told me only three limb legs matter, AVR, AVL, AVF. Then where are the remaining three legs? Because that's nine. Where are the remaining three legs? The remaining three legs, we don't see them. They are just acting on their own. Now let's look at this picture and it will help us understand. These three legs that we don't see are called lead one, two, and three. This lead one, two, and three, they are called bipolar legs. All the other legs we've mentioned, V1 to V6, they are unipolar legs. They just look at what they are told to look at. But you see this one to three, they are looking two ways. They are bipolar legs. They measure the difference between, they look at, look at this line. They form a line between AVR and AVL. That is lead one. So this look at my, the way me I am sitting now. You know I said this is my AVR and this is my AVL. Lead one is going like this. If lead one is going like this, that means it's looking at the left side of my heart. Am I making sense? Yes, you are. Now, uh, if, good. If one is looking like this, it's looking at the lateral side of my heart. And I told you that AVL is also here. Now, 
That is why lead one, AVL, V5, V6 are called the lateral leads. Any problem in those four leads means there is a problem in the lateral side of the heart. Am I making sense? Because one is looking here, AVL is here, V5 is here, V6 is here. A problem in this means there's a problem in the lateral side of the heart. Now let us look at um, lead two. I'll look at lead two. Now lead two is coming from this, my AVR. It's going to my foot. It's crossing like this. Now when something is going from up to down, what is it looking at? It's looking at the inferior part of my heart. Am I making sense? That is lead two. So you can see the way lead two is going down here on my screen. I, I know you, I, I should hope you can see my mouth. Lead two is looking at the inferior part. Lead three is now coming from AVL. Look at lead three. It's coming from AVL and looking at the left leg. So lead two, hope you're looking at me. Lead two looking down. Lead three looking down. AVF is already down. Those three leads are the leads that look at the inferior part of the heart. If these three legs, anything should happen to them, there's a problem with my inferior heart. We now, am I making sense? So that, that, is, that is what um, it, what's going on. Now look at it. As I said, this, this diagram will help you understand axis of the heart. Because on a normal day, the vector from lead one is looking this way. That means it's going from negative to positive. By the time the vector is going from this side, from my left hand, I'm coming back to my right hand. There is a problem. That is abnormal. Am I making sense? That is going to give me negative. Am I carrying everybody along? Yes. Do you mind explaining yes. the inferior yes. side, inferior part of the heart again? Sure. I can do that. Thank you. I said... Let one is going looking at the left. Let two is coming from so for let two is coming from this right hand, right? It's measuring the difference from here to here, like it's going down this way. I wish I could stand up, something like it's going down like this. Am I making sense? Let three is also coming from the left shoulder and also going down like this. Look at it on the picture here. Maybe I should stop using myself. So this is from the right shoulder. Lead one is looking at the left side of the heart. From the same right shoulder, lead two is going down, looking at the left leg, right? Lead three is also leaving the left shoulder and going to the left leg. So together, lead two, lead three, and AVF are the legs that look at the bottom of your heart, AKA inferior. Yeah, I, um, I got a message that uh, you are all muted. Yes. Okay. All right. So um, I just want to be sure I'm explaining well. So if anybody at any point you feel I'm not explaining well, it's difficult for me to talk and look at the chat at the same time. So please unmute yourself. I'll quickly draw my attention and tell me I'm not making sense. Please go over this thing with me again. So... Um, so two, three, and AVF are the inferior leads. Um, then we can move to the next picture. So we've, th this, these are the important things. V1 and V2, they are right by the sternum, they are septal. V3 and V4, they are on this side, they are anterior. Lead two, three, AVF, inferior. Lead one, AVL, V5 and V6, lateral legs. Making sense, I hope. So um, let's move to the next picture. Yeah. Now, this is our typical ECG. Anytime I'm not making sense, please unmute yourself and, and say something. Now, this is, the, this is how the ECG looks when you, you see an ECG strip. You can see our Bipolar leads one, two, and three are the first to appear. The limb leads that matter, AVR, AVL, AVF are next. Then we have the six um, 
the six precordial leads or the chest leads, right? V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6. The importance, the importance of this picture is to let you know that you can see two, three and AVF, they are called inferior. They are the ones that tell us when something is wrong with the inferior part of the heart. Look at one, lead one and AVL. You know, this is one and AVL. They tell us when there is a high lateral problem. Just, just think of it as lateral, right? If there's something wrong with the lateral part of the heart, they will tell us. And they do this with the help of V5 and V6, which are also lateral leads. While we have um, two, three, and four, mainly two, three, and four anterior, but more of three and four, while V1 and V1 is the most septal ledge, you can say that we all, V2 is a bit septal and it's also a bit anterior. So that is, that is everything, right? Now that the purpose of telling you this is, so when you see your, your ECG, you understand that where the problem is coming from, if there's any abnormality in the inferior leads, it's a problem, you know, that's, that's the point. If there's a problem in two, three, AVF, it's an inferior problem. Is it, if there's a problem in one, AVL, V5, V6, it's a lateral problem. A problem in three and four is an anterior issue. And if there's a problem in V1, V2, it's a septal problem. Okay, so back to what I was explaining without pictures. <laughs> I said the bipolar leads are one, two, three, while the unipolar leads are V1 to V6 and the limb leads. So we know our limb leads, AVR, AVL, and AVF. So we move to the next thing, which are the ECG waves. Now we need to understand the ECG waves as well so that we can know when something is going on with the P wave, what is happening. So this is how impulse travels in the heart. When it originates in the SA node, it travels to the bundle of E's. I mean, to the AV node first. So the AV node is, from the AV node, it enters the bundle of E's. The bundle of E's, it divides into two bundles, the right bundle branch, while the left bundle branch gives us two, two branches, which is the anterior fascicle and the posterior fascicle. It's important to know this. And it's important because if an impulse is not coming from the SA node, okay, now let me explain it this way. The heart itself has so many nodes that are capable of helping the heart to beat. But the SA node is the one that has, that beats faster. So the SA node has a range of about 60 to 100 beats per minute. The AV node is also able to produce impulse for contraction, but at a lesser rate, I'm not really sure of the, exact amount, but it is lesser than that, the rate of the SA node, right? So if something should happen to the SA node at any time, so, okay, let me put it like this. If the SA, because the SA node beats faster, it is able to quickly generate an impulse before the nodes, before the AV node, the, or and the other nodes in the heart are able to give the heart impulse to contract. But if something should happen to the SA node and this SA node is unable to perform, the other nodes in the heart will begin to contract on their own, send impulses on their own that will make the heart beat. And that is why you can have um, all these kind of tachy arrhythmias and arrhythmias going on because of a problem with the SA node. So the, one of the first things we check that is very important to us in an ECG is, is this reading coming from the SA node? Is it a sinus? In other words, is this a sinus reading? Because the only thing we want telling us how the heart should beat is the SA node. If it's not a sinus reading, there is a problem. Now let's move to the next picture. This picture is important because this is our P wave. So what is the P wave? The P wave simply, when you see the P wave on an ECG, it means the atrial contraction. The atria has contracted. That is what gives us P wave. Why is P wave not as tall as QRS? The P wave is not as tall as QRS because the heart does not need as much power to squeeze the atria like the way it squeezes the ventricles. You see, the heart is 
you, okay, well, we all know the heart. This is the picture of the heart. I don't know why I rely more on my hands than on diagrams. So this is the heart. Blood flowing from the atria to ventricles is helped, one, by gravity. Two, by the opening of the ventricles, it sucks blood from the atrium. So the, the atria does not need so much work to get the blood out of itself into the ventricles. So it doesn't use as much power. Since it's not using so much power, the P wave, that's what makes our P wave small. Am I making sense? If anything should happen where the atria should use more power than necessary to take blood, in, to pump blood into the ventricle, we are going to have a big P wave. Am I making sense? That's gone. Yes, you have. Yeah, okay. Now, what is the PR interval? Let's move to PR interval. The PR interval is the time it takes for impulse to travel from the SA node to the AV node. Because the AV node, we should, we, we assume that the AV node is the generator of, that it takes impulse from the SA node and then distributes it to the ventricles so that the ventricles can contract. If now we have a specific time, we expect that impulse to travel and that is called a normal PR interval. If the impulse, something should happen and that time from the impulse to travel from the SA node to the AV node is longer, we are going to have a prolonged PR interval. That is just what PR interval means. What is QRS? QRS is what the, it's when the ventricles contract. So a problem with QRS means there's a problem with our ventricle. So we've talked about a problem with P wave is a problem with our atrium. If it's too big, our atrium is using more power than necessary. If our PR is too wide, our impulse from the SA node to the AV node is taking longer than necessary. Now the QRS is talking about the ventricles. If our QRS is taller than necessary, it means our ventricles are using more power than needed to squeeze blood out of themselves. If it is wider, you know, if it is wider, that is time. If it's taking longer, it means that there is a blockage of impulse which is not allowing impulse to travel around the ventricles. Now, what is the T wave? The T, so some people, so P wave means, another thing they say is, I've explained it in terms of what happens, but the physiology is they say, P wave is atrial depolarization. In other words, contraction. QRS is ventricular depolarization. While T wave is the repolarization of the ventricles. That's the ventricles are recovering. That is the end of this picture. So look at this, what, we all, what we've already talked about. The P wave, it means the atria contracted. QRS. So the, the impulse from the um, SA node, which is the AV node, it goes from the SA node, passes through the atrium and right and left atrium, enters the AV node, enters the bundle of ease, enters the bundle branches, then the Punkinje network, then to the right and left ventricle, then repolarization, which is this T wave. That is all. Um, okay. can, you come up, can you come up with the T wave again? Okay, T wave is repolarization of the ventricles. That means the time for the ventricles to, I mean, for the ventricles to relax, basically recover. You know, the ventricles just finish squeezing themselves, right? In QRS. In T wave now, they are relaxing, coming back to themselves. That's repolarization. Yeah, to resting states. Please, what determines the height of the T waves? Well, this T wave, there are different things that can affect T wave, right? Electrolytes can affect your T wave. We all know when they tell us that hyperkalemia can give you a um, tented T wave, right? If the heart has just been injured in an ischemia or an, 
or an infarct. It can cause an hyperacute T wave. We'll get to all of that, but it's not in the um, in this part yet. Am I making sense? Yes, ma'am. All right. So. Yes, you are. Okay, let's go to the next thing. Eight thing. Now we've understood the basics. So that's ECG basics. <laughs> if you understand what is going on, you understand where the problem is. Now, if they give you an ECG strip, there are eight things that you must check on every ECG. What are those eight things? Let's talk about them. You want to, I call it, so people say, I changed, I switched it around a bit, but these are the eight things in other words. You know, you have to know the patient's ID, the date the ECG was done. That is very important. Just the way when they give us chest x-ray, we all know we'll say, this is the chest radiograph of Mr. So, 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 aching on so, 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 so. That is just baseline. On the ECG itself, you need to know the rate, the rhythm, the axis, the waves, the intervals, the is if there's ischemia, in fact, and then your impression. So you have to, on every ECG that comes to, in front of you, you want to know the rates. If the, the rates will let you know if there a bradycardia, is there a tachycardia, you want to know the rhythm. Rhythm is very important. Is it a sinus rhythm? Is it coming from the SA node? Is it regular? Is this heart beating as it should regularly? Or is it regularly irregular? Or is it irregularly irregular? You know, that is rhythm. You want to know the axis. The axis is important because it lets us know is the right heart under strain or is the left heart under strain? Where is the pathology? We want to look at the waves. We want to look at the P wave. We've talked about the P wave. If it's high, if it's wide, we want to look at the QRS. We want to look at the T wave. What is wrong? Is anything wrong with these waves? Because if something is wrong with my P wave, I know there's a problem in the atria. If there's something wrong with my QRS, I know there's something wrong with my ventricles, right? If there's something wrong with my T waves, I know my ventricles are not recovering the way they should recover. Something is also happening with my ventricles. So that is my waves. Now let's look at the intervals. The time from P to QRS. Anytime there's something wrong with my PR interval, there's a problem for my impulse to travel from my SA node to my AV node. If there's a problem with the QT, QT interval, you, you begin to understand that there's a problem with time. There's a problem with impulse transmission. Ischemia and infarct. We're looking at the ST segment. Is it depressed? Is he elevated? That will let us know what is happening. Then when you've taken all of this into account, you have to give an impression. Do you think this person just has a left ventricular hypertrophy or is having an anterior myocardial infarction? That is your impression from the ECG that you just looked at. So let's move to the next thing. This is my first poll, right? So now, which of these do you find difficult to interpret on an ECG? So please, can you all vote? And we'll end the poll quickly. Only two people have voted, three people, five, six, seven. Okay, uh, please let's vote as quick as possible so we can move, 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 move. And I'll share the result with everybody so we can all see what. The poll is ending in 40, oh, it's gone on for 41 seconds. Please can everybody just click. All right, I'm going to end the poll now. I'm um, just two seconds and we'll end it. 80 people, all right, you guys are clicking. All right, so I'm ending the poll. So um, from the poll, nobody has an issue with patient's ID and dates. <laughs> okay, you don't have an issue with um, rates or reading, mainly axis, okay, axis, waves, all, few people. So ischemia, 
in fact, impression. Okay. All right. So we'll move. So what will I say is the highest percentage? Axis. Okay, good. We're doing axis today. All right. Stop sharing. All right. So um, let's go to the next one. Now, this is how to document the ECG. I don't think anybody, uh, is anybody interested in that? How to document the ECG results in the notes? Or we can skip it. Please skip. All right, great. So approach to ECG interpretation. Good. So like every graph, we've all drawn graph in mathematics. The ECG graph is just like that. It's just a graph. It's a graphical representation of electrical activity in the heart. So the vertical axis, which is our Y axis, measures voltage, while the horizontal axis measures time. Like every graph, there are boxes, right? Um, each big box measures five millimeter. So when you count, this is a five millimeter box. Every big box is five millimeters. They are all squares. They are not rectangles. So they are all five millimeters. Inside every box, we have um, small boxes. It's made up of smaller boxes. So each of those small boxes are also squares and they are all one millimeter by one millimeter. So when we count, so this is one box, one, two, three, four, and five. So these are all um, squares. Now let's look at the horizontal axis. How does the horizontal axis translate into time for us? How does those, how do those small squares translate into time? Every big square is 0 0.2 second. Every big square, 0 0.2 seconds, 0 0.2. And then every small square inside that big square is 0 0.04 seconds. So anywhere a small square is, once you take a small square, it's 0 0.04, wherever it falls. So 0 0.04, when you multiply it by five, it's going to add, it's going to give you 0 0.2 seconds. Meanwhile, on the voltage axis, each small square is 0 0.1 millivolts. So you need 10 big squares, I mean, sorry, 10 small squares to get one millivolt. It's not really important to but just know that. <laughs> okay, so um, you, maybe you've always wondered, what is this square at the beginning of my ECG? That square, just it's just a calibration, the way the machine calibrates itself to know what it's going to do next. So this is the typical ECG without all those um, drama that was on the last screen. You have, as we said, one, two, three, the bipolar leads are first. We have the um, next thing is the limb leads, AVR, AVL, and AVF. Then we have the precordial or chest leads, V1 to V6. Now let's talk about rate, how to calculate rate. The normal heart rate is about 60 to 100 beats per minute. Bradycardia is if it's less than 60 beats per minute. Tachycardia if it's greater than 100 beats per minute. And I found out the, for me, the best strip to count rate on any ECG is the reading strip. What is the reading strip? I know I didn't mention that. Let me, let's look at this picture. This is, this three, these are, this, um, <laughs> the bottom, um, lead in an ECG. At the bottom, you always see one very long line. So like this one now, we have three redeem strips, V1, lead two, and lead three. Can you see they are very long? They're, they are not broken like the other leads, right? These are the redeem strips. They are the best for telling you rate. They are the best for telling you reading because they last for 10 seconds. Unlike these other ones, not that you can't use them, but it won't be as accurate. So anytime you have the opportunity to get the reading strip, because ECG is a skill we all need, whether you're a nurse, you're a doctor, as long as you work in healthcare, there'll be a time you'll have to interact with an ECG one way or the other. So it's a skill we should all acquire. Um, so 
once you see, once you get the ECG, at the bottom is the reading strip. Use it to count your rates. Use it to determine your reading. Now, how do we calculate rates? There are three main ways we count rates. And many people like to say rates and reading go hand in hand, meaning as you're determining the reading, you should also be determining the rate, right? So let's, let's start. The first way to determine rate is using the 300, 150, 175, 60, 50 rule. I will explain. The second way, okay, 300, 150, 175. For me, I just skip 300. I just tell myself 175, 60, 50, 175, 60, 50, 175, 60, 50. That's how I count. The second way is to take 300 because we believe that on an ECG, every big square is 300, right? So we divide 300 by the number of large squares between two arrow. Let me, two arrow. I'm just listing, I'm still going to explain. Then number three, this is why we say check the reading before you count the rate. Because if the reading is irregular or the reading is, or the rate is very slow, it doesn't make sense to be using rule number one or rule number two, that's 300, 100, 75, 60, 50. It's better you just count how many R waves are on your strip, if it's irregular or if it is slow. So let's look at the first rule, which is the 300, 150, blah, blah, blah. This rule states that you should find the first R wave that falls on a thick line. So I look at my reading strip. We all know what the reading strip is now. We, you look at your reading strip, determine which of the R waves, it's not all the R waves that will fall on a thick line. So quickly scan, is it a regular reading or is it, um, is it regular, a regular reading or is it scanty, that is, is it very slow? Then quickly find the R waves that falls on a thick line. When you find the R waves that falls on a thick line, you can proceed this way. The first big box, if there's one R wave that, after, this, after I found my first R wave that fell on a thick line, you can all see that this is a thick line, right? Because see the space one, two, let me click on the image. So this is one, two, three, four, five. So this is my first R wave that fell on a thick line, on, my, on a thick line. The, if another R wave should fall on the second thick line, my rate is going to be 300 beats per minute. If, my second R, if this is my first R wave here and my, the next R wave falls here, my rate is going to be 150 bits per minute. If my R wave falls here, it goes on and on like that. 300, 150, 100, 75, 60, 50, and so on. Me, once it gets to 43, I'm not counting anymore because I might as well only count the number of R waves because at 43 is already slow. It's bradycardia already. So what am I still counting? It's going to waste my time with mathematics. I just move, use my rule number three to determine my rates on that kind of strip. Any questions? Okay, no questions. Sorry, Chris, could you go over the 300, 150, 100? Like when you say it falls on the arrow wave, I don't, I don't get it, sorry, please. Let me not use this strip. Let me go back up to this type of ECG here. Let's look at this. This is a very, very good example. I'm looking at my reading strip. First thing I look at is all my R waves appear evenly spaced. Just by looking at this ECG, can't, can you tell that there is no cluster of R waves in one segment. We'll see, the, we'll see something that is irregular later. But looking at this strip, I can tell that my R waves are not clustered in any part with a big space. So this is a regular reading, as you understand. This is a regular bit. Now, for me to determine my rate, I, fed, I look at the first R wave. We know we already, we all know that this is a P wave. This is a Q wave. This is an R wave. This is an S wave. This is a T wave. This is P, this is Q, R, S, and T. The first thing I will do is find the first R wave on a thick line. And I can already see this is a thick line. So this is my reference point. My second R wave is falling here. 
So what am I going to do? Applying that rule of 300, the first big box is 300. If my R wave was here, it's 300 bits. But see, it's all the way here. So I'm going to count 300, 150, 100, 75, 60. The red of Okay, great. This is my first thick line, right? That's Using that. Possible. Your Using the rule we talked about, we go 300, 150, 100, 75, 60. Because you see, that is one way. See, I like this way because of those that go for OSCEs. When you go for an OSCE, there's no time to be over dividing and over calculating. This is very fast for you. You just go. You don't need to cram 300. You already know one big box is 300. The second one is 300 divided by 2, 150. So I, I mean, I only memorized 175, 60, 50. 175, 60, 50. Once you memorize it, you're good. 175, 60, 50. 175, 60, 50. Anything that falls below 50 means I can just count it with my hand and multiply by six. We'll apply all the rules on this particular strip right now. Using rule number one, I go 300, 150, 100, 75, 60. That's one rule. If you're not comfortable with that, try rule number two. 300 divided by the number of big boxes between my R waves. How many big boxes do I have between my R waves? One, two, five. three, four, five. 300 divided by five. 60. 60 bits per minute. Rule number two. If I'm not in my in any exam hall and I want I have all the time in the world, then I count the number of R waves. Let's go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten yeah. times six. Sixty. Fantastic. The three ways to count rates. It depends Sorry, on where you are. Okay. What? So the last one you said now. Can you can you please come again with the last one? The last one I said there eh, is for when you are relaxed, you are not in exam, or you are in the world, you have all the time. Because if I only use this um, one when there is bradycardia, there's too much space, my R waves are few. Because before I count to 10 and I have just two minutes in post encounter, I don't have time to be counting all my R waves, right? <laughs> I would rather go for on uh, 300, 150, and all those ones. But if you have all the time, this is what you do. Number of R waves on your reading strip times six. I just count R waves multiplied by six. So I count like this. First R, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten times six. Six, sixty. 60 bits per minute. I'm um, sorry, please. I have a question. Is it um, for the rule number three? Is it only when the hour waves are regularly spaced that we can multiply it by six? You can always use it. The three, you can always use um, multiplying by six for any strip. But you cannot use the 300, 150 for an irregular strip, never. Well, you can use number of R waves for any strip. So far, you have time. The only condition is time. If you have time, fine. But if you're in an OSCE, you might not have that time. Or, that's what I'm just saying. But some people might find the time. But, but if you want to, if you like this way, you can use it anytime, any strip. Count your R waves, multiply by six. Gives you a good estimate of the rate. You see, when you use different methods, these three methods, right? Sometimes there might be an error of up to five bits per minute. So it's very, always best to say, but you see, when you use the one of counting number of R waves, you're pretty, pretty much safe. Like you'll be as very, as close as possible because you spent time. So you'll be as close as possible. But when you're using the 300, 150, 100, 560, or the second one, dividing the number of large boxes, you might miss some things because not every ECG with you that you will find the R wave will fall on a thick line. It's not all the time. Sometimes your R wave can fall right in the middle. So in those cases, and you don't want to stress yourself, just just count your R waves. 
one, two, three, four, five, six. If it's 13, 13 times six. If it's 15, 15 times six. If it's 20, 20 times six, 120 bits per minute. If it's, you know, just count your R waves. Counting R waves any day, any strip, multiply by six, you get your rate. Sorry, sorry, Trinivas. The R waves, how many will you count? On your reading streets, all of them. All of them. All of them, none must be left behind. None. Uh, it's you, you must count all because the formula, the formula states, you know, when we use formula, you must mm -hmm. obey it. Mm -hmm. The formula states number of R waves multiplied by six. Number so all the R waves must be counted and you multiply by six. Okay. And then, sorry, that second method, what is it again? The small, small, the small boxes, right? The yeah. one where you say 100. Don't worry, let's go to another strip. I think, All right. can, yes, I'll show you another example. We have, oh my God, we've spent one hour already. Okay. All right, let me go to another example. So um, look, look at this one now. The second rule was we divide 300 by the number of large squares between the R, two R waves. So look at this strip now. This is our first R wave. This is the second one. We counted the number of boxes and went one, two, three, four, five. 300 divided by five, we got 60 bits per minute. I like this rule, this rule, this, this particular one, because I told you not all the time that your R wave will fall on a thick line. Look at this R wave. What if this is, these are the type of R waves you're getting? Are you not going to estimate rate? So if your R wave is not falling on a thick line, you have two options only. Is it that you count all the R waves and multiply by six, or you count the number of big squares and say, for me now, if it was me, I'll go one, two, three, four, five. You see, this, this, this is now 5.2 small boxes are here. You don't count your small boxes as 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5. It will not give you an old number. So I'll say one, two, three, four, five. Hmm? And go 5.2, 5.4. 300 divided by 5.4. Are you seeing where the variation in bits will start to come in? If, if this was how me, I calculated my own. It will now be 300 divided by 5.4. I'll probably get maybe like 58 point something bits per minute or 58 bits per minute, which is a variation from 60 bits per minute compared to someone that says one, two, three, four, five. Five times six. This is not a complete redeem strip. So this is just an example. Hope I'm not confusing anybody. <laughs> no. All right, so let's look at the third example now. If it is irregular, this is what we talked about. If it is irregular or it is very slow, Look at this type of strip. Can you see that? If this is only thing, do I want to keep going? 300, 150, 100, 75, 60, 50, 43, 30, 12. Doesn't make sense. I simply go one, two, three, four, five, five times six, 30 bits per minute. Are you seeing where I'm going? That's yes. So that, that counting is better for when yes. it's irregular and yeah. radical. And when it's slow. Yeah. So let's look at examples. This is our first example. We, as usual, we can have regular leads on top. But well, we want to use our reading leads, our reading strips to tell the rates. Let's apply rule number one. Look for the first R wave that falls on a thick line. I've looked, I've scanned, I scan, 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 is this one. And I, it's this one. This one is falling on R. This other one is falling on R. So let's go. 300, 150, 175. My rate is 75 bits per minute. Can you see how fast that was? Oh. It makes sense. 150, 175, I'm done. Compare me to the person that is going 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Thirteen times six. Uh, Seventy-eight bits. Seventy-eight. <laughs> Am I, are you getting it? So there's a difference of three bits. Me that I said 78 are more accurate, right? Because I, I really counted all the R waves and multiplied by six. But me that I went the short way and just said, in an OSCE, I will have more time because I went the easy way. If you want to use the third rule, you can go one, two, three, four, four big squares, 300 divided by four. Question of them. That, that sounds long. So those are the three ways you can estimate your um, your heart rate. So the rate on that one we just counted was seventy eight beats per minute. Let's look at this other one. What's the rate? Look for the first heart rate that falls on a thick line. I think it's this one. 300, 150, 100. Mm -hmm. The bad thing is, it's not falling on a thick line, right? Yes. So what do we do? <laughs> Two things you can do. If you are in the world or you have time, you can count all the R waves and go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, mm -hmm. 13, 14. 14 mm -hmm. times 6. 84 70 bits. Uh, 80, 84, 84, 84, 84. 84 bits 84 bits per minute now i put that somewhere we can try the other law and go one big box two big box three big box three sorry i'm trying to zoom in three divided by 3.2 3.4 3.6 300 divided by 3.6 because we have three small squares so 300 divided by 3.6, who can do that? Here's my phone. Let me also grab my phone. 83. 83. It's not far from what we calculated counting our waves. No. No, it isn't. Now, for me, in Ampolsky, this is what I will do. Now we've done those two ways. I'm just using this for those that want to do an OSCE and you want to quickly determine it. I'll go. All right. This is the first one that fell on a thick line. 300, 150, 100. 300, 150, 100. 300, 150, 100, right? This is 100 here. I'll mark it 100. The next line is 75. So my heart rate is what? Between 100 to 75 beats per minute, right? Now, what can I conveniently say that will make sense? If I just say, my heart rate is about 80 beats per minute, am I too far from the answer? No. A good estimate, it's about, I didn't say it is, it's about 80 beats per minute. It's about 82 beats per minute. Or it's about 78 beats per minute. It's not too far, far, far. So that's just for those going for OSCE. Well, if you're not going for OSCE, take your time, bring out your calculator, Count all the R waves, multiply it by six. <laughs> all right, so let's move to the next one. So the rate on that one was 84 bits per minute, right? Um, are we, should we do another example or just move on to something else? I think we should move on. Abhi, please, let me hear from you. Should we move? Can't do another example. Let's move on. Oh, we pull it. <laughs> Okay, just a quick example. This one looks complicated, right? This is another strip. Using, count the R waves multiplied by six. Who wants to count? Oh yeah, you guys, count this one. Count. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Ninety. Ninety bits per minute. Ninety. Beautiful. Ninety bits per minute. That's very good. Now, from did you count? Which, which line did you count? Sorry. The, the, one that the last yes. line. Yes. So you don't have to worry when you're counting the reading strips because if you can look at it, now you see these reading strips, they are all falling on the same line. The reading strips will always be the same thing. So whether you count V1 or 
or you count this lead two, or you count the bottom one, it's still the same thing you will get. So you don't have to worry about that. So, um, so that's using the last row. Then you can take boxes. Let's do boxes now. I'll use this one here, right? So this is one big box, two, three, 300. 3.4. 300 divided by 3.4. Eighty-eight. Eighty-eight point two three. Eighty-eight. Eighty-eight bits per minute. Is it too far from each other? No. So I think yeah, that was nice. Yeah. So let's do a poll now. Uh, let me go to the next one. So on a scale of one to five. It's one being the least and five the best. How confident are you with reading the rate on an ECG after our session on rates? I didn't think this class would take so long, my goodness. It's supposed to be one hour, so let's stop the poll. Um, share the link. So um, only 59% people, 59% said five over five. Or one person said no. <laughs> one, you're not still confident. Um, 4% said three, okay, on a scale of four. Okay, nobody said two, that's good. All right, so, um, we've really gone, like, I, I thought by now we'll be done, like, so please, can you put your questions in the chat? Let's let's take a look at people that have, anybody that has a question. Okay, sorry. You can put your question in chat, but before we do that, please put your questions down. Dr. Bukumi is going to be compiling the questions so we can answer them. Let's quickly look at this strip. I think this is a very important strip for us because this is an irregular reading. Now, see what I was saying? Just by looking at this strip, the reading strip, can you see a cluster of R waves here? A big space, another space, Another space, the space is getting smaller, smaller, and another cluster here. This is an irregular reading. Am I making sense? It's not like the other one where the R is. Does it make, if I yeah. do 300, 150, 175, 60, 50, is it the same thing I'll get here? Is that the same thing I'll get here? No, no, no. 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 What's the best way to count the rates on this type of street is to simply go. One, two, three, yes. four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, eight. 60 bits per minute. So this is what I, was, I meant by saying rate and reading go hand in hand. Once I look at the strip and I can see that almost these boxes are not looking the same all over the strip, we got to do R waves times six. If I look at yes. the strip and all the R waves are so far apart, so scanty, I better just count my R waves and multiply by six and end that rate session. <laughs> Yeah. So, it's so that. good to know. Yes. So, this is the same thing. This is another um, irregular strip. Can you see a cluster here, a big space here, another space, another space? So, it's like left and left versus right. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, fifteen, ten, thirteen, ten, six. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven, eight, eight, seven, eight, seven, eight, seven, eight bits per minute. Yeah. I didn't finish counting, but I assume you're right. <laughs> what did you call it again? Say it. 78, 78 bits per minute. You can say it, that's 78 bits per minute. Beautiful. So that's rate. That's rate. Rate is not hard. Rate is not hard. Just use those three rules and you're good to go. So um, I don't think, I don't know if we can go on and on. <laughs> Um, 
what, what is doing reading? So, um, um, Buk um, Dr. Bukumi, please give me the questions. Let's see if we can take them. Did anybody drop questions? I can't see the chat room. Yes, somebody did. I think when you started by giving the introduction, somebody asked for any training certificates. Oh, not so certificate. Sorry. Person wants to verify what that is. Mm -hmm. Then um, there was a question regarding first degree heart block. Is um, first degree heart block medically significant, and what is the treatment? I think I answered that already. Okay, good. All right. Um, then another question, um, somebody said, I believe there's another rule of dividing by 1,500 by the number of small boxes to find the root. Right. Then what is the significance of a U wave? Of a U wave? Yes. I'll write, right now, I, I don't have the answer for that because it really comes off, like it's not a wave that is predominant on most ECG. So it's not something you really, really, really come across. Yeah. So at this point, because I thought we we're going to spend an hour, I really think we're still going to come back to all of this because I was going to go into more details about reading, about access, but there's something I must do because people are leaving the class, right? So let me get to no, we still have about 92 participants. It's been between 92 and 97. All right. So let's let me just go into this. Are, this is what we're going to do in the ECG models, right? The basics models. We're going to look at rates, reading axes, the waves and the intervals. See, we spend so much time just talking about rates and the basics of ECG. Left bundle branch block, right bundle branch block. How to tell if there's hypertrophy, atrial hypertrophy, ventricular hypertrophy, ischemia impact how to interpret and manage um, common ECG strips, including ACLS strips, right? We're also going to do a revision. So that is going to come up on October 3 and 4, the same time, 12 p.m. MDT, that's 2 p.m. Toronto time, 7 p.m. West African time. Registration okay. after this class. And it's a paid class, right? So the complete cost of this ECG basics is 20,000 Naira. The conversion is there on the screen, 50 US, 65 CAD. If you refer a friend, both of you can pay 50,000 Naira or 45 USD, 60 CAD. If you refer someone, if you share a review of this class on social media and you tag me, you're going to get 10% off referral and base price. So you're ending, going to pay about 13.5 or 54 Canadian dollars, right? A very good bargain for all the things you learn because you always need ECG. Whether you stop, whether you're a medical student, you started working as a doctor, or you're just managing conditions on your own, right? Or you're preparing for an exam. It's really good to know what ECGs are all about. So you can reach me, and if you just need career navigation, I of also offer that service. It's twenty five dollars or twelve thousand naira for an hour. And I'm also into skincare. I told you about that. You can find videos of that on my YouTube channel and it's $15 for a consultation. I also offer tutorial classes for PLAB2, PLAB exams, Canadian licensed exams, that's MCCQE, QE2, Narkovsky and USMLE. The prices are all on my website. So thank you. But I thought in case for those leaving, well, we're going to go back over the class. <laughs> so- No question. Okay, sorry to cut you short. Um, somebody asked, can we get the lecture notes into our inbox? I think lecture notes for today's class. The lecture notes? Well, I'll okay. think about that, but the video will be up. Um, I don't really give our lecture notes. Yeah, I think some people could not hear you well. They didn't hear me. Okay, you know what? I'm, I'm going to modify the audio. I'm going to modify the audio, like increase the volume, then post it on YouTube for those that did not hear me in this class. I'll send you the link. Okay. All right. Is there any other question? No. So let's look at reading now. So I've advertised my class, right? For those that are interested, if you want more about the ECG basics, you can send me an email or you can register on my website. I promise you, like if you really enjoy this class, you're really going to enjoy the complete ECG basics course. So let's talk about reading now. As we said before, 
we want all our impulses to come from the SA node. If it's not coming from the SA node, it's not sinus reading. We want to look at how the beats are happening. Are they happening regularly at, or are they irregular? And if they are irregular, are they regularly irregular or they are irregularly irregular? You need to consider that. Then you want to look, is it a narrow complex tachycardia or is it a wide complex? You want to know all of that. Now, how do we determine sinus reading? We need to look at the P wave. And what do we want from the P wave? The P wave should be positive in lead one, lead two, and AVF. Okay, yeah. Sorry about that. Yes. So just got an answer from my friend. So U wave, you see it in hypothermia and digitalis toxicity. It, yeah. It's seen in hypothermia and digitalis toxicity. It's not really a common wave, like I said. So let's look at our reading, right? Thank you for that, Dr. Bukumi. So let's look at what we said. Looking at this strip, is this when, so the, when we look at an ECG strip, as we said, the first thing is patient ID and the date it was done. The second thing is we determine the rate. The third thing is we want to check the reading. Is this sinus reading? Is it regular? Mm -hmm. Now, how do we look at sinus reading? We look at the P wave in lead one and AVF. We expect the P wave to always be positive. Positive. Like every graph, anything above baseline is positive. Anything below baseline is negative, right? So we expect our P wave to always be positive above zero on the baseline, right? And we look at lead in this one. Let's look at lead one. P wave is there. Is it present or not present? It's present. And then we look at lead. Sorry, what was your question? Is P wave present? Is P wave present or not present? in lead one present it's present is it, and is it positive yes yes we look at avf it's, it's present it's positive this is the sinus reading it's coming from the essay note that is how we know that's all a positive p wave in lead one and avf if you want to be extra extra you can look at lead two it's also positive there. The only time your P wave should be negative ever is in lead AVR. Can you see the inversion here? That is a mm. negative AVR, I mean, a negative P wave. That is the only lead where you ever find a, a negative P wave. Anytime, any, all the leads, our P wave should be positive. Once it's positive, it's a sinus reading. The next thing is, is it regular? I have a very simple trick. I just take two fingers. You know, we first of all said, look at the strip. You can see if there's a cluster of waves in any part. Besides that, if you're not sure, take your two fingers like this. Can you see this, my two fingers? Put it on your R waves. What I mean by that is this. Let's say this is my, my, my sheet of paper. I go like this, R wave to R wave, I measure. I'll take it to the next one. I'll take it to the next one. I'll take it to the next one. If I'm going from one R wave and it's like this. Hmm? Then the next one is like this. Then it's like this. Then it's like this. That is an irregular reading. Am I making sense? Yes. Yeah. So that was a very simple way. If you look with your eyes, you're not sure. Take your two fingers, go boom, 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 boom. It's irregular. If it's going the same way, the same measurement, boom, you do it again, boom, you do it again, boom. Ah, it's regular, it's regular, that's okay. So sinus reading, regular. Heart rate, 78 beats per minute. Make sense? So let's do that with this strip. What is our rate? 300, 150, 175. Is this sinus? P wave present in one, lead one, and AVF. Sinus reading. I take my two fingers, I check all my R waves. They are the same. Do it on your own screen now so you don't forget how to do it. Put your two fingers like this and start measuring the distance between your R waves. Can you see that your finger did not move? We're going to look at another one that is irregular. You see how your fingers will be shifting all over the screen. And you check this uh, RR everywhere. 
Yes, Jackie. Sorry, uh, we can we can the one that do with the finger. Sorry, we can see. I, I okay. Ted, when you look at your ECG strip, please just look at your ECG strip. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You will see a cluster. If it's an irregular reading, you will see a cluster. You will see cluster of R waves. They will be packed together. You will see another one, space. You know, we talked about that in some previous strips. You will see space. We'll, then another one, it will be packed together. So if you're not sure of what you saw with your eyes, take your two fingers like this, yeah? Put it on your R waves. Okay, where's my pen? Let me draw something here. Can you see my hand now? So I go like this. This is these are two R waves. Hey, I know you won't see. Where is my screen not showing? All right. So I don't know. So this is my. It's not showing. So let me not bother. You can't see it. So let's say this is my ECG strip, right? If I take my fingers between two hard waves and it's like this, are you seeing it? Yes. If I now go to the next hour wave, the distance between, and I, it goes like this. The next one, it goes like this again. It goes like this, the next one. It goes like this. That's an irregular reading. Mm. Does it make any sense? It does. So let me, let's go to a, a, an irregular strip. You see an irregular strip now. So let's look at, let me just show you an irregular strip so you'll see what it looks like. Beautiful. First thing we do when we want to check for reading, we look at the P wave in lead one. Is it positive? It's positive. It's present, it's positive. We look at AVF. This is our AVF. P wave is present, it's positive. So say this is a P, a QRS. This is a T. This is a P, this is a QRS. This is a T. Now, this is, so since there are P waves and they are positive in both one and AVF, that's a sinus reading. A sinus reading is a reading coming from the SA node. So that is a sinus reading. Sinus reading does not mean you don't have an arrhythmia, right? You can still have an arrhythmia, such as in AFib or atrial flutter. A sinus reading coming from the SA node does not mean there can't be an arrhythmia. Now, how do we know that this strip is irregular? First thing we did was looking at this strip. Look at where my arrow is. Can you see the space between this R and R is wider than this one here? Yeah. See this space here, compare the space here. One, two, three boxes. One, two, three, and almost four here, right? Now take your two fingers. So there's a cluster here. See the big gap here. There's a big gap here, a big gap here. Then the big side. You take your two fingers like this. These are our R waves that we counted before. Can you see my mouse? Now use your two fingers and start going from R wave to R wave, checking the distance between the two of them. Start watching how your fingers will be expanding, contracting, expanding, contracting. Please try that lesson. So who, who has tried that? Uh, what was your experience like doing that? Please, let's hear from you. It's um, irregular. You could see that your, your fingers kept get, getting wider, closing up, wider, closing up. Yes. So that is a very easy way to tell that. If your eyes could not confirm it enough for you, you can use your fingers. They say, what you cannot see, at least let us feel it. So now we use our fingers. We've confirmed that, yes, my eyes are not lying. It is not regular at all. So this is sinus reading, irregular. 
right? And you can still use that same figures to tell, is it regularly irregular? What's irregularly irregular? Because you will see, maybe you went like this. Okay. I don't know if you are muting yourself, but you keep coming up. Let me mute everybody. So, you're not saying something. Please, if you're not saying anything, don't unmute yourself. Um, okay, so. If I go like this on my strip and maybe I went bam, bam, one, two, then it went boom. I go another one, bam, bam, one, two, it went boom. That is irreg regularly irregular, right? But if I'm going, it's going one, two, three, four, you know that? And it's, my fingers just keep widening and contracting anyhow without any pattern. That is an irregularly irregularity. Am I making sense? Okay, I know I can. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. yes, you are. Okay, all right, great. So let's keep, let's keep reading. I think let's move to Axis, please. So I'll, uh, okay, there's a poll after Axis. So let me check the, after reading. If you don't Hello, read, please. What? If it is not a sinus reading, what else do we call it? It just says it's not a sinus reading, right? It's not sinus. Okay. This is not sinus. It's not sinus. Okay, thank you. You can now you can now say it is um the a ventricular rate. It will not be heart rate. It will not be a ventricular rate of. Am I making sense? Okay. Not be ventricular rate of so 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 because it's not coming from the SA node, it's the ventricles that is basically contracting, doing its own, because we are counting RR interval. If we are counting the RR interval, right? If we are counting RR interval, that means there is definitely a heart rate, but it's not coming from the SA node. The ventricles are the ones doing the job. So it's a ventricular rate we're counting. Yeah, that is why when our P wave is missing, if we cannot find P wave, we say that's atrial fibrillation. In that case, okay. it, I, I forgot to say something, sorry, please. When counting heart rate, it's not only RR we can count. Some people count PP interval, but I just, I feel like, I personally feel like RR is easier to count than PP because we said PP is a, PP is a small wave, P wave is a small wave, right? So it's easier to count RR interval than to count PP interval. That's what I found. Yeah. Okay, uh, you're about to explain something. It's like when the, you said when it's, um, what did you say now? When it's irregular, well, how it is P wave, like, okay, no P waves, a traffic relation. But if going by what you said before, anything P means it was atrial, atrial contracted. Mm -hmm. So based on that, how, how does no P wave mean atrial fibrillation? Like I just wanted to get it from from basic, like you said, it. when we see P waves at all, then it means the atrial contracted. When we don't see P waves, I'm problem. wondering why the name. The name is the atrial. With the atrial right? Okay, so the fibrillation is the problem. Okay, yes. okay. Well, please, can you all answer this? <laughs> Okay, uh, 63 people chose to vote. What happened to the rest? <laughs> wake up, wake up, wake up. I hope the class is not boring. It's not at all. Right. So, 47 people said five. For anybody, if you're still not understanding after this class and you think you need any help, please reach out in my email, info at tell them or on my website to me and we can arrange a basic course. All right, so 
um, I think I've shared the results, right? So people only, um, most people scored four over, said four over five, right? So of those in 2 percent D, 13 people in two and three, please reach out and be in the basics course. <laughs> okay, now let's look at axis. Axis is the most, it's, to me, is the simplest thing to check on an ECG. I found out it's simpler than rates. It's easier than reading. It's just so simple. What do we look at on axis? We're looking at our QRS complex. What do we want? We always like positive. Everything in our ECG, we want it to be positive. We should all be positive people, happy people. So we want our PRS to be positive. So where do we look? Just like the P wave, we checked for P wave in one and AVF. We're looking at our QRS in our lead one and eight VF. If you want to be very good, you can add lead two. But for me, I just stick to one and AVF. So let's look at the axis, right? When our, we want a positive mean QRS, right? So if we have a very big R wave like this, that is a positive mean QRS. If we have a negative mean QRS, that means we can see the S wave is very big. That's a negative mean QRS. And if R and S are equal, that's an equiphasic mean QRS. That means it's also normal. Now you see this circle here, it's called the Eindhoven's triangle. I know it's a circle, but I, I intervene triangle. <laughs> so just like we discussed when we were talking about the leads, right? This is AVR. Imagine the way, you know, look, I know this thing is in front of you, but remember when we do chest X-ray, our left arm, left is always facing our right. Our right is always facing our left. So that's why I like to demonstrate this thing on my body, but it, it will still be the same way to you. So look at it, AVF is at the bottom. AVF is at the bottom here. Look at our right arm, AVR, augmented vector right. AVL, augmented, <laughs> augmented vector left. Then see the horizontal line. That is, can you see from our right arm, the lead is going to the, to the left. And that is lead one. From AVR, right? You can see a lead going to the opposite side. Look at it here, going down. Can you see it going down like this? That's lead two. I feel like I should not even stress you with all this information, but because of physiology, people like to know physiology. Let me, let me just simplify axis. They will come into the complicated part because you don't even need this circle when you are calculating axis. It's not even necessary. It's just for you to prove that you know something. So let's enter the cocoa and let me not confuse you with that circle. What do we want our QRS in lead one and AVF to do? We've already said when we are looking at axis, we're looking at lead one, we're looking at AVF. What do we want them to be? We want them to be happy and positive, looking up. So we want QRS to be positive in lead one, we want it to be positive in lead two, and that is a normal axis. That is a normal QRS, means our heart is happy, nobody is under strain. So Look at lead one here. The QRS is positive, yes or no, yes. Look at AVF, the QRS is positive, yes. And based on that, our QRS complex falls in the normal axis, which is the left inferior quadrant. See me, how I, how I describe my own. Maybe if I put it on my body, it will make sense. Divide me into four or divide yourself into four. My green screen won't allow you to do that. <laughs> so divide yourself into four. Hmm? Uh, in the middle, put a straight line in your middle, right? Under your, yes, above, on your tummy, put a straight line. Imagine that straight line looking from left to right is your lead one. The one going down the middle is AVF. The one coming from the top, from the right arm straight, looking at your AVF is, is um is lead two. Lead two. two. L. Looking to cross to the other side is your lead three. That is how you do that triangle. Now, see, we say QRS, we want both of them to be positive. That is normal. There are two ways you can determine axis. If you want to be, I'm not a sexist, I'm a feminist. But look, if a woman should sit and her legs are straight like this, she's normal. 
she's still putting her things together. You see, her ties are covered. But if her knees should point to each other, her knees are our QRS. If they point to each other, you know, she, her, her, her privates will still be covered. She's still right. She's still right. But if that woman should open and the QRS goes like this, that's left. Sorry, can you take it to you? A woman, when she's sitting down, we want her to sit like this, positive. Everything should be positive, up. Yeah. But if she still sits and her knees point to each other, she's still right. Because she's going to cover her thighs, right? She's going to cover the, the inner part. But if the woman should take her knees apart from each other and the two knees are opposite like this, you know what will happen if a woman should sit like this? That's left. That's left. That's an easy way for us to remember. Another way you can remember is this. If your QRS are returning to each other, they are right. Return, right, axis deviation. Return, right, axis deviation. The woman's knees coming together, pointing at each other, right, axis deviation. The woman's knees separated, leaving each other. That's left axis deviation. Same thing. If our QRS are leaving each other, it's left axis deviation. If they return to each other, it's right axis deviation. Let's look at pictures and see what I'm seeing. So now we've established positive in one and AVF is in normal axis, which is the left inferior quadrant. Let's look at another example. In this lead, in this one now, hmm? our QRS is, the mean QRS is what? Negative, right? Right? Negative. Yes. While the AVF is positive. So what? The woman's knees are what? They are, they are, they are, they are positive. They are coming to each other. They are returning to each other. What is that? Right. right, that's right. right. Good. And that is what it's falling. Chicken, that is axis for you. That is right axis deviation. Chicken, now that's all. Sorry, for you say it again. One is coming down, and okay. AVF is going. Okay, look at it. One is coming down. AVF is coming. The, the QRS is what we're looking at, right? The QRS, yes. The main QRS. So one is coming down. AVF is pointing at it. Pointing, the woman's knees are pointing at each other. The woman's okay. knees are pointing at each other. She's okay. right. Yes. Right? She's right. And once because she's right, that's a right axis deviation. Yes. If you don't like that, you can say returning to each other. QRS returning to each other is return, mm -hmm. right axis yes. deviation. Pointing to each other, and knees pointing to each other, right axis deviation. So far, they are sharp coming to each other. It's a right axis deviation. That's all. We don't need to start imagining any Eindhoven's triangle. I just wanted to show you some physiology, right? <laughs> but that's all axis is. It's the easiest part. Let's look at another example. Look at lead one, like this, ABA. The, the QRS, they are leaving each other, right? The woman's knees are pointing apart, though. can you see? Yes. Her knees are not meeting in the middle. What is that? Mm -hmm. She's definitely left axis. axis. She's not normal. She's not right. What is she? She's, She's left. left. Let's look at another example. This, this, this are her knees. This in lead one is going up. The other one too is going up. You know, a lady is a lady not supposed to sit feet together and at toes mm -hmm. and like this. What is yes. this? That is a normal axis. Mm -hmm. It's a normal axis. Yeah, That's it. Positive in lead. Mm -hmm. So positive in lead one. Positive, positive in, in AVF. Normal axis. That's all. There's no need for any item. No, sorry, you need to understand I told you. So I wanted to explain. They will now go to I told you, if you like. <laughs> you are facing the same direction, normal. 
not just person the same direction. See, if this woman should oh, this go, oh. Oh, okay, okay. Everyone is like this. Sorry. Yes. I'm not seeing you. And the APF is like this. I mean, this is extreme axis. That's what. Extreme axis. Okay, okay. So. Same direction. Pay attention to the positive and negative. Are they? Up, like more positive. We want all of us in society to be upright and positive. There mm -hmm. we are. Yes, if we all meet in the middle, if we return to each other, we are still right. Right. Mm -hmm. about to each other. Left. And if all of us are negative, oh. that's the truth. Making sense? Yes. That is all. That is axis. That's the end of axis. So, I don't know. Is there any other example? The question here, right? Is it possible for the QRS complex on lead one and A to point in the same direction? What should that be called? He said, if they are both pointing up, it's normal. Yes. If pointing down, they are negative. Because anything that points up is positive. If one and ABF, the QRS are both positive, that is a normal axis. Normal axis. All of us positive people. We should be upright citizens. But if we come together, if we return to each other, if our knees, if the woman's knees point to each other, she's still right. She's still protecting what we don't want. We should not be seen. That is right. But if she opens everything like this, <laughs> that is left. And then <laughs> if all of us, if she becomes negative, extreme. That's like, that's extreme. That's so is that like extreme angle or extreme axis or something? Sorry. Extreme axis. Yes. Okay. Oh, except you want me to now start explaining the Eindhoven's. We can really go into Eindhoven's now. Oh. Because see, let me tell you something. Let's look at Eindhoven's now. Now that I think we've gotten an idea, look at it. We say that let's like, look looking at like, right at. So it's going from negative to positive. Let me go back to the second thing to be clear. Excuse me, please. Is left as left axis same as A stream? No, left axis is not the same as A stream. In extreme, the QRS in one and AVF will both be negative. Uh -huh. Okay. They will both be negative. They will both be pointing down. Okay. See, if they point down like this, if they both point down, that's extreme. If they both point up, they are normal. If they yes. point to each other, they are right. right. If they yeah. point like this, they are left. If they point like this, they are extreme. Okay. I didn't get the left one then. Show left, show left again. Mm. Your video is not showing. Return, right. Leaving, left. Return, right. Pointing to each other, returning, right. Leaving, <laughs> leaving, left. Return, right. Leaving, left. Okay. Right. Normal. Okay. okay. Negative, both of them. Yeah. Are Extreme. 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 Thank you. So now, look at this Eindhoven triangle, right? We said our lead is looking from our right hand, is looking at our lead. So it's going from negative to positive. If it starts looking from here, if it comes, if we look at our axis and it's coming to the right, are you not seeing that it's going to enter right angle? Well, come and give me. Am I making sense? Now, imagine me, as I said, divide me into four. Hmm? AVR is here. AVF is down there. Now, do you know that a negative AVF is my, let's say, is up here, my head now. So because you've divided me into four, positive AVF is down at my feet. Negative AVF is up here towards the head. If you look at the QRS in AVF hmm, and it is negative, that means the axis is here. Hmm? You look at it in lead one and it is also negative. What happens? It's towards my right hand. What does that look like? It's a right axis deviation. 
Our normal angle should be, let me, because if I go into the details, it might become confusing. That's why I kind of said, okay, let me explain what, how to just determine the axis before we go into the Eindhoven's triangle. So do you still want to go into Eindhoven's triangle or we should just leave it at that axis where we talked about? It's okay. Let's leave it like the axis. Okay. <laughs> so let's, not, let's not confuse it. Yes. We have only one minute in the exam. Uh -huh. So we'll just, we'll just pick it up. Yeah, returning right. Leaving left. Both negative, extreme. Up positive, looking up, normal. Shikena. That brings us to axis. So let's go to the conclusion of the this thing, what we've done. So if you, for those that would like to see, so this is what we talked about. We said, we've looked at our rate. We used our R wave to count the rate, right? The goal is to count rate. We use R wave. We looked at the length, the reading strip. We expected it to be 60 to 100 bits per minute. If it's less than 60, it's bradycardia. If it's greater than 60, sorry, if it's greater than 100, it's tachycardia. Then we looked at reading. How do we assess reading? We look at P wave, in LED one and AVF. We want it to be, we expect it to be positive and present. If it's absent, it's AFib. If it's um, not present, right, then it's not a sinus reading. And that concludes that it's an arrhythmia. We want to check axis, we use QRS. What are we looking at? LED one and AVF. We expect it to be positive in both one and AVF. If they point at each other, it's right axis deviation. If they point away from each other, it's left axis deviation. If they are both negative, it's extreme axis. What does that tell us? There's a heart strain. Oh, that means there's either a right axis deviation or a left axis deviation. Shikena. What, how does normal look? They both look up. They both look up, upright, positive. Mm -hmm. both, both are positive. Mm -hmm. Normal. Okay, okay, normal, both are positive. Sorry, you said if P wave is absent, what was it? If it's absent and irregular, what do you say it is again? Sorry, I didn't get that. If it's absent, AFib. If it's absent, it's not a sinus reading, right? Yeah, that's AFib, yeah. Okay, so for that uh, axis, both positive, both the positive deflection normal, both yes. returning or facing each other, that's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's summarized okay. in this table. Can you see this table? So okay. at the end of that ECG basic course, there will be a complete table showing you just the way these things are rates, reading, axis, interval, okay. all the things okay. that you should know, how you should manage, everything will be summarized in the table. So you can basically grab an ECG strip and go, okay, well, I want to check PV. Where should I check? I want to check axis. Where should I check? So that is the end of ECG. Um, let me launch the poll. One more poll, right? Oh, I forgot to stop sharing my poll results. <laughs> that one. All right, so let's look at axis, right? So on a scale of one to five, with one being the least, you guys, please vote. How confident are you with knowing the axis on an ECG after our session on axis? Only 55 people are voting. What's going on? Please vote, come on. 56, okay. Well, it's big. Wake up, people, wake up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to end the poll. All right, I'm very happy. Um, so people said um, the five people, oh, yeah. One person said no confidence. Wow, wahoo. <laughs> okay. So um, one more poll, and uh, that should be the final poll. <laughs> How helpful have you found this class? Please, nobody should put one if I catch you. <laughs> oh my God. Please vote, please vote, please vote, because this is going to be really helpful for me. I don't see Polo. Nothing showing up on my. Oh, really? Nobody? Nothing showing up on my page. Oh, on my own. Right? Yeah, maybe. 
right. All right, so I'll end the poll. 80 people are here, 82 people are here. Why are you not voting? Come on, vote. This is how we should be voting, you know, everywhere we are. <laughs> okay, I'll end the poll now. So I'll share the results. 45 people found it helpful. Thank you very much. I'm very grateful. Um, 16 people found it helpful. So thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much to everyone that joined this class. I thought it was going to be a one hour class, but I'm surprised we spent almost two hours and I'm glad that it wasn't a waste. Maybe I should have pulled you and asked, please, who, found, who thought this was a waste of time? I know you won't say it. You'll probably be thinking it in your heart. <laughs> Definitely not. So, um, thank you so much to anybody that has joined the class. Do you have any questions? Let me try and locate the chat room or you can unmute your mic and ask your question now. Oh my God, I love all the comments. Thank you so much. Not a waste of time. Best hello. Hello, Dr. Hello, please, can you? Hello? Hello. Hello. Yeah, please, can you send this lecture to our inbox, please? <laughs> my, my slides, I don't really share my slides, right? I'm going to edit the video and put it up on YouTube. It's on YouTube. Yeah, I'm going to put it up on YouTube and I'm going to increase my voice so that everybody can hear. I heard some people had difficulty with that. This is the best ECG class I've ever attended. Okay, I'm very funny like that. I like I like reviews. Yeah, that's me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Please, thank you so so much. So please, like I said, today if you found the class helpful, there's still so much to learn. We still need to learn about the waves, the intervals, how to know if there's an AV block, first degree, second degree, third degree left bundle branch block, right bundle branch block, how to know if the atrium is enlarged or the ventricles are enlarged, ischemia infarcts. Then if you're planning to take ACLS, we'll talk about the ACLS um, ECGs. So we're going to cover all of that as well as management and do the revision. So I'm planning that class for October 3 and 4, same time, because we can't finish this thing in one day, right? So it's going to be a two day session and the registration after the class. The Zoom link will be shared with you when, after payments. So this is the price list. If you really want the lowest prices, you'll need to respond, and then you need to tag me on social media and say something positive about my class. So that, you know, if you can't, <laughs> so, so if, you, if you're able to get a friend to attend and you're able to um, tag me on a social media review, you can pay as low as 13.5, and as low as 54 Canadian dollars. The prices are on the screen, right? Trust me, as someone said this is the best ECG class. I'm going to tell you, if this is the free version, you can imagine how much more better the paid version is going to be. I am going to put in so much more effort, <laughs> even though I really put in a lot in this one. Then if you're for medical students or doctors that need some career advice about how to approach exams, what are the next steps to take? I provide career navigation consultation. I also provide skincare consultations and tutorials for PLAB exams, uh, medical council exams in Canada and NACOSKI, as well as USMLE um, exams. I work with a team of doctors that have already written and passed these exams and we're able to guide you with our experience. And so the prices are all up on uh, my website, drheldemore.com. Thank you very much to everyone that has attended. Please send your feedback. I'll be very happy to attend to that. Thank you, thank you so much. Is there thank any- you, Doctor. Dave. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Dave. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I look forward to seeing all of you next time. <laughs> Have a wonderful day. Hello, hello, hello. Yes, hello, hello. Yes, Dr. Casey. Yeah, uh, we are waiting for the YouTube link. Okay, it's going to be on the my YouTube, YouTube channel. Link. My YouTube channel is helping. I think, um, okay, let me go back.
Yeah, I, 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 I put it up on this post, right? Oh, I don't think so. So all my handles are tell them more. Like, I don't know why it's not here, right? Okay, yeah, see it. Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, I'm on all of them. Ex Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook. You'll find me on at health then more health then more so check back okay. uh, i'll send an email so for those on gmail please always check your promotions folder my emails always land in that folder i'll send you the link to the video when it is up but for my slides i don't really share my slides I, i'm sorry about that but i'll share the video on youtube thank you so much is there anything else i can help with All right, so if everybody's leaving the class, I don't think there, there are any more comments. All right, thank you so much, everybody. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, bye. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. It was a very insightful class. Thank you. Truly appreciate it. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye.